I'm going to touch upon that in this slide because it has to do with text classification. And it is one of the first papers that was using language models to do transfer learning for te text classification at least. But then uh, I guess next week, we are going to do another important task in natural language processing, which is translation. But then after that, we are going to go back to language models and do transfer learning all the time. Okay. The model is called ULM fit. It's universal language model fine tuning. And this is for text classification. What are the applications of text classification? You can do spam. Is this email and spam or not spam? Is this uh, email or is this comment on LinkedIn or another social media platform? Is it a fraud? What is being posted on Facebook? Is that a bot or that's a real person? You can have emergency response. So these are the sorts of question answering type. Uh, do you, another application could be legal discovery. So there is some commercial document and then you want to classify them. What are we gonna do? We are gonna have a language model. I'm not gonna go into the details of what is a language model, but for now, this paper made an observation that for images, you would train your a model, let's say a residual a ResNet on uh, ImageNet. It's gonna give you some parameters. It's gonna give you a pre-trained network that you can use it for other tasks like segmentation or object detection. The question is, can you do the same thing for natural languages? Can you do transfer learning? And for transfer learning, for languages, we are gonna do language modeling. For language modeling, what is the task? Somebody gives you a sentence, for instance, universal language model, and then you want to predict the next sentence, the next word in your sentence. So that's a language model. Given the previous words, can you tell me what is the next word? And then you want to increase the likelihood of that happening, giving you the correct answer. And as you can see, this doesn't need any labels. This is unsupervised. You just look at unlabeled corpuses and you have plenty of them on the internet. And then you just train, for instance, an LSTM. For now, let's leave with LSTM because this is 2018, okay? Once you have those parameters, we are gonna use them for a classification task. But before you are gonna be able to do that, you're gonna need to do some fine tuning on your data for this particular task that you have at hand for let's say text classification. So that's one trick that the paper is using. And the other one is a slanted triangular learning rate. So before this paper, things were not working. This idea is very simple, but it was not working. And this is the first paper, one of the first papers that using some tricks managed to get that big picture, big idea working. And you're gonna see the ideas are not fundamental. These are a bunch of tricks, but then once it works, you get the big picture that yes, it is also possible for text. Not only it is possible for images to do transfer learning, you can do transfer learning for text as well. So these are the tricks, discriminative fine tuning, slanted, triangular learning rate and gradual unfreezing. What are we gonna do? We have a source task, which is your language model. Given these three words, predict the next word. You have a target task, which is your text classification. And we were doing it so far. That's our target task. And this is a different task from your source task. And you don't need to worry about this. And we are gonna do a general domain language model pre-training. First, you train your language model. We are gonna use Wikitext, so you can take a look at that data. These are from Wikipedia articles, and this is how many articles are in that data set. This is how many words you have. This is unlabeled, and then you train it. You train your language model. It's gonna be an LSTM, you train it. But then for your text classification task, you're gonna have a bunch of text. On those texts, you're gonna fine tune your language model. So you're gonna ignore the labels. You're gonna ignore the classes. You're just gonna look at your pure text and fine tune. Here's a trick. This is discriminative fine tuning. The trick is you're gonna do gradient descent. These parameters are the ones that are already trained on your large corpus. So you're gonna initialize your network with them. But then you're gonna divide your parameter space per each layer. 
the first layer of your LSTM, the second layer of your LSTM, up until the last layer of your LSTM. So you're going to divide them. And then you're going to have parameters for each of these layers. So you're going to have parameters specific to each layer. And then you're going to have learning rates specific to each layer. So you're going to have different learning rates. Rather than doing gradient descent that way, you're going to do gradient descent this way. So you're going to have learning rate for each set of your parameters per layer. And as you get closer to your input, your learning rate is getting smaller and smaller. So you're changing the ones on the top faster compared to the ones at the bottom, closer to your input data. So that's a trick. And this number is some magical number through trial and error. Okay, the idea of this paper is just, you want to get that idea of transfer learning working, no matter the cost. So let's just try to make it work. This is one idea. This is actually a trick. The other trick is a slanted triangular learning rate. Don't worry about the math here. The math is for it to be exact. But what is happening in the end, you start with a learning rate initially, you increase your learning rate, and then you decrease it gradually. Another trick. So you increase your learning rate, you let it go down. And T is the total number of iterations that you're going to have for your fine tuning. And these are specific realizations of these parameters. So you're going to have some parameters here. And the ratio that you see here is going to tell you what is the smallest, what is the biggest learning rate, and uh, what is the ratio between the two. Basically, how smaller is the lowest learning rate compared to the biggest learning rate. So far, so good. So we pre-train a language model. We fine tune it on our task. Now we're going to transfer learning. We are going to freeze most of the parameters. And on top of those parameters, we are going to add a bunch of other layers. So we are going to add two additional linear blocks. These are fully connected. One of them is going to have a ReLU activation. The other one is going to have a softmax because in the end, you want to end up with probabilities of your classes. And we know that you're going to have an LSTM. A sentence goes in, a sequence of vectors comes out. So this is a sequence of vectors. This is out of your language model. Then before adding these uh, additional linear blocks, you take the last entry coming out of your LSTM. You're going to take the max, max pooling of these and you're gonna do the average pulling of these vectors. You're gonna concatenate them, and then you're gonna take that and push that through your linear layers. You multiply it by a matrix, you apply ReLU on it, you multiply the outcome by another matrix, and then you do softmax on it. And that, in the end, that's gonna give you a probability. Here's another trick. You're gonna gradually unfreeze the parameters of your language model during training. Now your loss function is coming out of classification. And then don't worry about backpropagation through time. In modern machine learning frameworks and deep learning frameworks, this is actually implemented. So don't worry about that. So you're going to do two backpropagation, one for fine tuning, one for your text classification. Here are the data sets that you're going to use. And you're going to have different tasks, question answering, sentiment analysis, topic classification. Here are the size of your data. And here are the results. Compared to the previous state of the art, you are doing much better. And the idea of transfer learning is working. After doing some tricks, the idea of transfer learning for texts is working. And you're transferring whatever that your language model learned to the task of text classification. I think we are one minute over time. For those of you who want to leave, you can leave. And for those of you who want to stay and ask questions, I'll be around. Um. So I was curious, the, the, the BIOS TM that we looked at just previously had just one hidden layer. And in this case, uh, you could kind of generalize that to have like the input go into BIOS TM and that output go into another and that output go into another and continue like that. And that's these H1, H2 up to HT? Uh, no. Or are the H1 up through HT just like word one through word T and the, the embeddings that come out from that? So what we saw before was just one layer of LSTM. So LSTMs are deep in time, but then you can make them deep in uh, space as well. Okay. Okay. So what is the task of an LSTM? On, in the first layer, when L is one or L is zero, your sentence goes in, 
and a bunch of a sequence of vectors is going to come out. Then you're going to take that and push it through another layer of LSTM. A sequence goes in, a sequence goes out. Then you do the same thing. A sequence goes in, a sequence goes out, and then you do it for capital L times. So these are both deep in space and deep in time. Mm-hmm. But whatever that you do in the end, you're going to end up with uh, H ve- T vectors. Uh, and this is after all of those layers of LSTMs. At the, like the final output layer. At the final output layer. Because each layer is going to take a sequence as input, output a sequence. Take the same sequence, output another sequence. And in the last layer, you have a sequence. And that's, okay. So we don't, we don't necessarily store all the in- intermediary sequences. They're just computational and then we throw them out. Exactly. So they are just there to help you. What you're going to be interested in is the last guy. So this T here is not lo- not your layer. Yeah. It's the size of your uh, sequence. Got it. L is the number of layers that you have. So T is the depth in time. Yeah. L is the depth in the space. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other question I had is that this training uh, slanted triangle process is probably pretty helpful with really all models, right? Uh, this is actually a technique that people use a lot yeah. these days. So yeah, that's a very good technique. I think there is a question from Matthew that I want to answer as well. Are all of these tricks primarily needed because LSTMs are hard to train or do these tricks appear in transformers as well? So no, you need these tricks. This is the first paper trying to do transfer learning, or one of the first papers trying to do transfer learning from unlabeled corpus to labeled corpus. And things before this paper were not working. Sometimes you have a great idea, and then things are not going to work when you take them to computer, especially in deep learning. Things are not going to work. But these guys were really persistent. They said, we want this idea to work, no matter the cost. And in the end, these were the tricks that they needed to use. So one of them was discriminative fine tuning, which is smaller learning rates for lower layers. The other one was this slanted triangular learning rate. And the other one was gradually unfreezing the the layers. So no, it's not because LSTMs are hard to train. It's because doing the transfer learning was hard at that time. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, sure. I had a question. My, my internet kept disconnecting on the first slide, uh, so I, I missed a few things. I was wondering if we can uh, go over it, if you have a second. Sure. Thanks. So I, I missed the part about um, the LSTM CLF. So I, I get the input. We have X1 to Xn, which is the input words. And then the output is classification for each word. Um, I is the input. Um, so it's, it's one of the gates. Is that the... IT, is that the forget gate? IT is the input gate. Mm-hmm. This model doesn't have any forget gate uh, because they wanted to save parameters. And the way that they are saving parameters is that F of T is equal to one minus I of T. So there is actually a forget gate, but it's implicit. This is the forget gate. Makes sense. But the then they are tying is... their for- forget gate to the input gate. Uh, what is it again? So they are tying the forget gate to the input gate. So F is one minus I. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And then um, O of T is the output. Um, so we are gonna study LSTMs and gated recurrent neural networks in details when we okay. do speech recognition, because there are multiple versions of them. And the question is, which one is the best? What is a crucial component? So, so it turns out we are gonna learn about it later. It turns out that this tan age is really cr- crucial so you cannot get rid of that. And then this forget gate, no matter how you want to code it up or what formulation you're going to write for it, you're going to need to have a forget gate. So this term and this term here are crucial. The intuition behind the forget gate is that, I guess it's similar to attention, how much, um, I guess, attention should be put to the previous word? Uh, yes. So you want to get rid of some of the information that is already in CT minus one. That's the idea of the forget. And we do that when the words are, I guess, not really correlated. They're just random. Uh, so when, like, the question is, when, when do we get a high value for forgetness, hypothetically? 
So let's say, let's see if IT is one, what's going to happen? If IT is one, then you're not going to uh, remember anything from the past. All you're remembering is through your age. age so of you, can think of, you can think of CT as a shortcut connection through all of your layers because you're going from, this is deep in time, okay? Mm -hmm. So you're going to have a route, C1, C2, C3, up until Cn that you are not seeing. But then sometimes you add information to that. Sometimes you subtract information from that. Some of the details you're going to keep, some of the details you're going to forget. Because if you remember everything, then uh, you're going to be in trouble. Not every single information accumulated in CT is inform informative. That makes sense. So CT is um, all the information in the previous worlds where age of T minus one is only the previous world. Yes. Okay. So it's the same thing with human. We have a shortcut connection through the history of our life. And then uh, sometimes we forget stuff that are irrelevant to the to our lives for the future. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And this um, is the same thing. So you're forgetting some of the information. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, then I had another question about A. So A is, I get it's a matrix um, compatibility scores. So it's gonna be 11 by 11 over here. How do we, and it's gonna be a learnable one. So how do we get a score? You mean, how do we get A's? Uh, yeah, so I know we initialize A because it's a learnable one, a learnable matrix, I suppose. Yes, so P is coming from your LSDM model. A is the parameters that you choose. So you initialize them randomly and then through this objective function, you're gonna learn them. You're gonna learn that, for instance, I per should have a higher probability of appearing after B per. So these are the sort of things that you're learning in A. So the transition score from B to I is higher than going from I to B. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. And P you said coming from the softmax? And P is coming out of... Uh, so it's gonna be a, I guess the argmax or... Actually, no, P is not coming out of the softmax. It's uh, before the softmax. These are the scores. But then your softmax is here. Okay. What is the purpose of um, taking all possible tag sequences? So we were doing the same thing. This is, you want this to be a probability distribution, okay? Mm -hmm. And a probability distribution needs to add up to one. So you need to take into account all of the other possibilities. And why is that? Because in the end, you are maximizing this probability, yes? So you're maximizing the probability of the correct class. At the same time, if they add up to one, all of these possibilities, you're increasing the possibility of the correct outcome, and then at the same time, decreasing the probability of the wrong outcomes because they have to add up to one. So all of the possibilities, because it's a probability distribution, needs to add up to one, and this uh, softmax is doing that. Okay, so E of E to the S, that the top out is the... I guess it's a. I guess it's also a matrix of probabilities of what's the probability of each word in the sentence to be each class. So S of X and Y. Mm -hmm. This is X. This is your Y, and these are the correct class. So this is the score of the correct class, and then what you're writing here is the probability of the correct class. Uh, and then if you do a summation over all of the possible tags, that's going to add up to one. Yes because that summation is gonna cancel out with this and it's gonna give you one. So if you increase this probability, you're decreasing the probabilities of the wrong Ys. So if you have Y1 and Y2, if you, and Y1 is the correct label, sorry, Y and Y prime, Y is the correct label, Y prime is the wrong label. If you increase the probability of the correct label, because this is a probability distribution, it has to add up to one, the probability of the, long, the wrong label is gonna go down automatically. Because you have a budget of one, you're increasing the contribution for one of the probabilities. So the other probabilities have to go down because that's your budget. Your budget is one. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and the reason it's so big is because we have so many different possibilities for every word in the sentence. Yes. So we have to go through this trouble because of the fact that the independence assumption is not a good assumption here. Otherwise, this why would be very simple you could have only 11 outcomes or nine outcomes. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense now. Mm. Um, 
because if you have yeah. the independence assumption, mm -hmm. you would just, uh, the probability of y1 given x1, the probability of y given x is just the product of the probability of y1 given x1, y2 given x2, yn given xn. Right. Or if y1 if they were independent, but they are not independent. So we have to take all combinations. Okay, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Why are we doing the, I mean, I, I get why we're doing the bi-directional when we were taking walls because we can flip the walls and it will have the same meaning. At least that's what I thought. Why we're doing that? So why are we doing that when we're taking characters? Well, for characters, because uh, first of all, why do we do character-based model? Because there might be a new word that we see in production or during testing that we didn't see during training. So this part might be the unknown. So you're gonna look up the unknown, that's gonna be a vector, but then this part is gonna compensate for it because each word you can write it as a bunch of characters. So is that similar to the, what we did with the n-gram, um, one of the models, when we divided a word into sub-words to get a better representation of a word and also for production, if we have a world that we haven't seen? Yes. So there is a problem with character-based models is that your sequence length is going to become very long. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. That's why we, a way to compensate for it was subword models. I see. And why are we going backwards? I mean, I get the right because A comes after M, so you actually learn the word, but the going backwards doesn't really make sense to me because if we're predicting R after S, it's very unlikely that it will happen. Uh, so the idea of forward and backward LSTMs in general is that the word A depends on the word M, the word, sorry, the letter A depends on the previous letter, the previous character, and the character coming after it. So it's a way of encoding that by directionality. Again, the same thing is happening here. The probability of seeing an a after M, it probably is bigger than the other way around. So these are not independent. So the reason we're going backwards is to take the forward, like R as well as M into account when we're looking at A? Yes. When you look at A, you're taking into account R and M. Not okay. only you're Makes taking into account M, you're taking into account R. So you okay. want to Makes have an sense. entire representation for the entire word. Okay, cool. That cleared up a lot of things for me. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Bye. Bye.